Hey guys, since my last couple of videos have been about, uh, disability, abuse, redemption, genocide, Ultron, I figured I ought to lay off the heavy stuff for a while. A friend suggested I make a video about something I liked. Something fun. I wasn't sure what I wanted to cover until I remembered my Great Gatsby obsession. You see, as a teenager, I had to read The Great Gatsby for English class. And you guys gotta remember that the queer rep landscape has changed drastically over the last decade. Like really, really fucking drastically. In 2013, I was a freshly realized queer person and really fucking discouraged by how few stories had room for people like me. Thus, I was always on the hunt for a whiff of queer subtext, which led to the notorious book discussion day where I raised my hand, proposed that Nick wasn't straight, and my classmate shot me down like, well, like Gatsby, I guess. And I cradled that resentment like a bundle of hot coals within my breast, and I waited year after terrible year for my chance to unleash that fiery burden upon the world. For some day, I would have my vengeance. They'd see, they'd all see, that this book is really fucking gay. Now here's how this is gonna go. I'm gonna describe the plot of the book, then talk about what I think makes the book queer, and then I'm gonna talk about how the movies handled that queerness. Or, you know, didn't. Suddenly, I began to like New York. A couple notes before we begin. One, I'd like to explore the queer angle of The Great Gatsby, but I do not condone Fitzgerald's or Nick's bigotry. This book contains some real racist and anti-Semitic bullshit. Just know that I don't hold this story up as the great American novel or a cinnamon roll too pure for this world uwu gay romp through the tulips. It's racist. It's anti-Semitic. Today we make Fitzgerald's grave spin like a hamster wheel. Two, if you don't like the word queer, you'll want to close this video. I'm a queer person and I use that word as an umbrella term. Three, Queer theory tends to make people really defensive, so I want to clear this up now. I believe that two objectively correct analyses can exist at one time. If you read Nick as straight, then congratulations, you are right. There is a very valid version of this book where Nick is straight as a pole. I also think there's a valid version of this book where he's not straight, and that's the version I want to talk about today. But that doesn't have to be your cup of tea. You. You, you don't have to watch this video. <laughs> well, now that that's done, time to force my gay agenda onto a book about car crashes. Summary. It's June, 1922. Nick Carraway, fresh from the war front and weary of, well, life, moves to West Egg, Long Island. He rents a cottage next to a mansion owned by a mysterious rich guy, Jay Gatsby, who throws lavish parties. Nick goes to visit his cousin, Daisy Buchanan, and her very muscular husband, Tom Buchanan, who lived directly across the bay from Nick and Gatsby. At Daisy's house, Nick beats Jordan, a famous golfer. Later, Nick takes the train with Tom to New York. Nom take, Nom? <laughs> Who's Nom? <laughs> Tom takes Nick to meet his mistress, Myrtle Wilson, whose oblivious husband owns a gas station. Also, this guy named Dr. T.J. Eckelberg made a billboard of eyes that freaks everybody the fuck out. Tom and Myrtle then take Nick to an apartment where a drunken party ensues. Here, Nick meets Mr. McKee, who we'll get to later. Nick goes to one of Gatsby's parties with Jordan as kinda sorta his date. The two wander around the mansion for a while. In the library, they meet a drunken man that Nick calls Owl Eyes. Nick also meets Gatsby, who more or less dazzles him. Gatsby takes Jordan aside to tell her something. In late July, Gatsby details his supposed history to Nick. He claims he's a war hero from a wealthy family with an Oxford education. 
he and Nick have lunch with a gambler named Wolfshine. It's strongly suggested that Gatsby gets his money from bootleg boots. Gatsby asks Nick to meet with Jordan for tea. Nick follows Gatsby's command, and at the tea garden, Jordan reveals what Gatsby told her at his party. Turns out, Gatsby met Daisy five years ago as a penniless soldier. The two fell for each other, but the army called Gatsby away, and he didn't return to the States for several years. In that time, Daisy married Tom Buchanan. Gatsby, determined to win Daisy back, did the logical thing and amassed a fortune, bought a house directly across the bay from her, and threw giant parties to try and tempt her over to West Egg. This has not worked this far. So now he's asked Jordan to ask Nick to ask Daisy to tea. Nick agrees. He kisses Jordan and then arranges to meet Daisy for tea at his cottage. Daisy arrives, Gatsby surprises her, and the two reunite. Gatsby gives Nick and Daisy a tour of his mansion. Daisy cries into some shirts. We get a flashback where Nick reveals Gatsby's true past. James Gats was a North Dakotan fisher boy who decided to shake his poor legacy with a new name, Jay Gatsby. He took off with Dan Cody, a rich yacht sailor, and wandered around the seas for a couple years before Cody died and Jay left for the Midwest, met Daisy, and got shipped off to fight the Germans. Back to the main timeline. Tom kind of realizes Daisy and Gatsby have a thing for each other. They all decide to go to town. Tom demands to drive Gatsby's car, so he and Jordan and Nick take Gatsby's yellow car, while Gatsby and Daisy take Tom's blue car. Tom stops to get gas at Wilson's garage. Wilson has found out Myrtle's having an affair, though he doesn't know with whom. He's decided to force her to move out west. Myrtle sees Tom in the yellow car and yearns. Everybody congregates at a hotel. Gatsby confronts Tom and declares that Daisy belongs to him. This does not go well. Nick and Jordan are still here for some reason. You can tell Daisy has decided she's not gonna run away with Gatsby. It's also Hello, Nick's birthday, hooray. Friend. Well, time to go home. Daisy and Gatsby take the yellow car out of town. Tom, Nick, and Jordan take the blue car. Daisy's driving the yellow car when they pass Wilson's garage. Myrtle sees the yellow car from afar and thinks it's Tom come to rescue her. She runs out into the road to receive the car and... <laughs> Tom arrives however long later, and he and Nick and Jordan find Myrtle's body. This makes Tom furious. He and Jordan and Nick all arrive back at Tom and Daisy's place. Jordan tries to drag Nick along to have some food, and Nick puts his foot down and says no. This pretty much marks the end of their fling. Gatsby has taken the fall for the car crash. Nick wakes up at dawn and finds Gatsby. The two wander around the mansion and smoke together. Gatsby tells Nick more about his real past, Daisy and the war and his brief time at Oxford. Nick misses several trains to stay with Gatsby. He finally decides to go to work, but promises to call Gatsby at noon. Meanwhile, Wilson has gone to Tom's to avenge his wife. He thinks Tom owns the yellow car, but Tom assures him that it's Gatsby's. So Wilson walks over to Gatsby's mansion, shoots Gatsby, and then shoots himself. Oh no! Nick mourns Gatsby. He arranges the funeral, which only he, Gatsby's dad, and Owl Eyes attend. Tom and Daisy flee New York, retreating into their carelessness. Insert metaphor here about the allure of the American dream and how we'll never move up the ranks. The end. Okay, so where's the gay? Where is it? Where is it, you little cop? Well, to understand that, we need to understand Nick, because his dishonesty reflects on his sexuality. And I know that sounds weird, but please, please, please stick with me. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. See, to be a reliable narrator, Nick needs to be a neutral party, to not contaminate the story with personal bias. Hallie Edwards warns, as a reader, you should be skeptical of Nick because of how he opens the story, namely that he spends a few pages basically trying to prove himself a reliable source, and later how he characterizes himself as one of the few honest people I have ever known. After all, does an honest person really have to defend their own honesty? I promise I'm honest, guys. Super duper honest. Nothing like those other people. I'm so moral and reliable and I would never lie to you. Have I mentioned how honest I am? Now excuse me while I go help cover up an affair. There's the fact that Nick hides Daisy's affair from Tom, 
but I feel like Nick's biases are exemplified by his stance on Tom and Gatsby. Iwasiolek put this perfectly. Gatsby is, after all, a bootlegger, a criminal, perhaps even a murderer or someone who threatens murder, if Tom's report of Walter Chase's fear is accurate. Tom makes love to another man's wife, but so does Gatsby. Tom buys Myrtle for a few trinkets and Daisy for a $350,000 necklace. Gatsby tries to buy her with his magnificent mansion. Tom orchestrates a rather messy party in which people get sloppy, drunk, and violent, but so does Gatsby. Only the scale is greater. Tom may be insensitive to people, but Gatsby hardly seems to be aware that anyone other than Daisy exists. Nick claims he's always disapproved of Gatsby, but when you compare the way he describes these two men, you can tell that under all the cynicism, Nick finds Gatsby gorgeous and pleasant and finds Tom arrogant and cruel. He wants Gatsby to succeed and Tom to fail. If Nick were truly to view these two men through a reserved, neutral lens, surely he wouldn't prop Gatsby up so much. Surely he would not say to Gatsby, You're a rotten crowd. You're worth the whole damn bunch put together. What the hell? What has Gatsby done to deserve that status other than lie and break the law and try to buy Daisy's love? What's so special about him that separates him from the rotten masses? Nick's clearly biased here, but why? I posit that deep down, Nick suspects he's not an honest person. Maybe that the war has done more damage to him than limit his tolerance to other people's riotous excursions. But Nick still wants us to see him as that neutral camera lens. He needs outside reassurance because he's started to doubt his own hype. And Gatsby embraces and validates Nick's facade. He smiled understandingly much more than understandingly. It was one of those rare smiles with a quality of eternal reassurance in it that you may come across four or five times in life. It faced or seemed to face the whole external world for an instant and then concentrated on you with an irresistible prejudice in your favor. It understood you just as far as you wanted to be understood, believed in you as you would like to believe in yourself and assured you that it had precisely the impression of you that, at your best, you hope to convey. So, that sense of reassurance might give Gatsby a leg over Tom. It's possible that Nick also likes Gatsby more than Tom because he and Nick are kindred spirits. There's a lot to compare and contrast between these two. Both Nick and Gatsby grew up in the Midwest, they both fought in the Great War, stationed close enough together that Gatsby even recognized Nick from his battalion. They both returned from the war to find their hopes dashed. They both left the Midwest for Long Island. They both hide behind their respective facades. Gatsby his wealth and Nick his honesty. I'm 30, I said. I'm five years too old to lie to myself. Sure, Jan. But I feel like Gatsby's hope captures Nick the most. Here's the excuse Nick gives for why he decided to make Gatsby his exception. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. No, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. By the end of the book, Nick's curiosity about Gatsby's hope has turned to a kind of blind devotion. The compliment, you're worth the whole damn bunch put together, shows that as much as Nick may shake his finger or roll his eyes at Gatsby, he upholds him as a symbol of hope and purity amidst a rotten, careless world. Which... <laughs> what? This dude? You want to pin that on this dude? The vaguely creepy, childish, obsessive, egocentric bootlegger? This dude? <laughs> so that's the end of the straight version. Nick's bias towards Gatsby because he relates to him, or he's blinded by hope, or both. Then there's the queer version, which can be read on top of the straight one. That Nick thinks Tom's hot, yeah, but he has a huge stinking crush on Gatsby. A lot of us queer folks have had to lie to ourselves and others at some point. We've established that he's not a reliable narrator, and romantic attraction would certainly help explain his Gatsby-sized blind spot. It also makes sense for Nick to bury his queerness as a way to preserve his morality. And that's that, because I'm equating your morality to queerness. 
It's because it's 1920 and there are a lot of backwards views out there and we'll talk about this more later. Woo! But back to the story at hand. It's fun to read Nick's devotion to Gatsby as romantic, because then you get to compare and contrast Nick's love for Gatsby with Gatsby's love for Daisy. It seems to me that while Gatsby might have fallen for the real Daisy when they first met, over the years Daisy became a symbol to him. Almost five years. There must have been moments, even that afternoon when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams, not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. Then there's the besotted Nick, who, while he claims he's always doubted Gatsby's facade, believes Gatsby came out of this mess all right. The Gatsby was a victim, and the real problem lay with the people who preyed upon his hope. There's truth to Tom's statement here. It's all dust in your eyes, Nick. Just like it did with Daisy. Gatsby's aim was to dazzle Daisy, but as much as Nick denies the fact, he also fell under Gatsby's spell. Then there's the fact that Gatsby doesn't care about the real Daisy. He loves her as a symbol, and she never gets to know the real Gatsby. He never tells Daisy his past or even his real name. Nick speculates that Gatsby might have lost his hope at the very end, but as far as we know, Gatsby never left his dream world, where he and Daisy lived happily ever after in his mansion full of polo shirts. He just couldn't face reality. But even as he's swept away by Gatsby's hope, Nick cares about the man underneath that smile. Hundreds of New Yorkers were taken by Gatsby's lavish parties, but when he died, no one but Nick, Gatsby's dad, and Owl Eyes attend his funeral. I cannot find anyone who knows anything real about Mr. Gatsby. Well, I don't care. He gives large parties, and I like large parties. They're so intimate. All these people cared about was the facade, not the real person. Nick, meanwhile, sits up with Gatsby for hours to hear him tell the story of James Gatz, the poor farm boy from North Dakota. When Gatsby dies, Nick's the one who makes the arrangements, who calls number after number to beg anyone to come to Gatsby's funeral, who's there for Gatsby's father when he arrives from the Midwest. You could even say Nick sacrificed part of his own facade for Gatsby. When the book began, Nick clung to that role as the neutral observer, but that required him to be detached from the events around him. He could have left someone else to care for Gatsby and preserved that, you know, false sense of distance. Instead, he shucks the veil of neutrality and anoints himself the point person of Gatsby's funeral arrangements. You could honestly say he takes up the role of the grieving widow here. That's a far cry from neutral. I wanted to get somebody for him. I wanted to go into the room where he lay and reassure him. I'll get somebody for you, Gatsby. Don't worry. Just trust me and I'll get somebody for you. There's still deception between both of these cases, but when you compare the two, Nick's love for Gatsby, platonic or not, was more honest and real than Gatsby's love for Daisy. So that's a little bit gay. I feel like no Gatsby analysis is complete without at least a nod to Jordan because she radiates queer energy like smoke from a house fire, but... Yeah, I, I don't know about how that relates to Nick. He did have a fling with the most androgynous woman he could find. But, you know, that doesn't make him queer. You could be straight and have a type. But, hey, worth a, worth a nod. Oh my god. At last, we've arrived at the holy grail of Gatsby queer theory. Do an air duck. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the procedure, everyone? What's the procedure? Stay calm! Okay. So here's where a lot of queer people stop and go, Wait a fucking second. 
Let's backtrack to that party with Tom and his mistress, Myrtle. Enter Mr. McKee, a pale, feminine photographer and his shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible wife. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments. Both Myrtle and her sister Catherine get up close and personal with Nick, but Nick doesn't make a move on them. In fact, his descriptions of them make it seem like he's turned off by their advances. He only reaches out to Mr. McKee. Mr. McKee was asleep on a chair with his fists clenched in his lap, like a photograph of a man of action. Taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek the remains of the spot of dried lather that had worried me all the afternoon. Like, have you ever talked to someone with a piece of tape or a leaf on their shirt and spent the whole conversation wishing you could find an excuse to reach over and brush it off? That could be the vibe here, which I love. But also, that's kind of tender. Because Americans are... a lot of things. But we're also super rigid about physical contact. It's socially acceptable for a friend to pluck a hair off your sweater or tell you you have a bit of lather on your face, but by the time you're an adult, you'll rarely see anyone but a loved one reach over with a napkin and wipe that lather off your face for you. So that starts the evening off with a bit of a... questionable undercurrent? Then this happens. Mr. McKee turned and continued on out the door. Taking my hat from the chandelier, I followed. Come to lunch someday, he suggested as we groaned down the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed. I'll be glad to. Okay, so Nick leaves the party with Mr. McKee while everyone else stays behind. But the night's not over yet, lads. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed. I'll be glad to. I was standing beside the bed, and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear, with a great portfolio in his hands. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery Horse, Brooklyn Bridge... Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning Tribune and waiting for the four o'clock train. We cut directly from the elevator to Mr. McKee's bedroom, with Nick beside the bed and Mr. McKee very nearly naked under the sheets as he reads aloud from his portfolio. Nick left the party and took that elevator a little before midnight. We have no clue how long Nick waited for the four o'clock train, and therefore no way to put a timestamp on how many of the hours between midnight and four Nick spent with Mr. McKee versus how many he spent wandering around New York City or waiting at Penn Station. How long did Mrs. McKee stay at the party? For all we know, Nick could have been with Mr. McKee a full hour before the scene with the portfolio. We don't know. Is Nick fully clothed? Is this all post-coital? What the fuck is going on? Because I mean, yeah, Fitzgerald could have gone feral for no reason. Why not? But there are so many ways to show that two characters are drunk. Why a bedroom? Even a living room would have felt less explicit. Why did Fitzgerald strip McKee down to his underwear? And all these ellipses <laughs> suggest something happened, whether before or after the bedroom scene. How much of the night does Nick not remember, and how much has he chosen to cut out? It's honestly like Nick senses a scene has become too gay and yanks the car around to the next one like, So I left the party with some guy, and we went down to his room, and he took his shirt and pants off, and anyway, there I was at Ben Station! About Gatsby's parties. Now usually I have to work to explain the queer version of a text. This time, I have to work to explain the straight version. To get to why I really think Nick ended up next to an underwear-clad McKee, I finally have to give some background on Fitzgerald and how he feels about queerness. In 2020, the queer rights movement has advanced enough that a good chunk of the American population understands that queerness doesn't somehow reflect a person's morality. It's not a choice, it's who you are. A fact, like how you look and where you were born. In 1920, New York's relationship with queerness was complicated. Queer nightlife bloomed, and while many straight people were fascinated by queer culture, or at least drag shows, bigotry was still the social norm. Fitzgerald was very concerned 
with homosexuality. He wrote about queer people. By all accounts, his masculinity was very fragile, to the point that he felt the need to assert his straightness to his friends. Across all the articles I could find, there was also a consensus that while Fitzgerald would sometimes accept fairies, he still viewed queerness as a moral deficit. To Fitzgerald, queerness was something that could happen to any man without enough resolve, and he seemed fascinated by that supposed struggle. In Tender is the Night, Fitzgerald's last completed book, the character Dick Driver talks to a gay man about his sexuality. It's a hole and corner business at best, Dick told him. You'll spend your whole life on it and its consequences, and you won't have time or energy for any other decent or social act. If you want to face the world, you'll have to begin by controlling your sensuality. Fitzgerald notoriously borrowed elements from his own life, people and places, as well as his own past and problems, and mash them together to make his stories. You'll have to explore all the parallels between his work and his real life on your own time because this video is already so fucking long. <laughs> but yeah, Fitzgerald's struggle with masculinity and morality could have bled through to the scene with Mr. McKee. Maybe Fitz only wanted Nick, the false observer, to come across some gay guy for the lols. Or it could be commentary about Nick's morality told through the lens of queerness. That could have been Fitzgerald's version of a Nick can't be trusted billboard. I bring up Fitzgerald only because his background gives us one way to understand this scene, not because he's the one with final say over what's queer and what's not. I'm one of those death of the author types, and I feel like as long as you can back up your claims with textual evidence, you get to decide what the story means, not the author. Also, the context of a story can change with the culture. Maybe a hundred years ago, this scene somehow would have seemed pretty straight. Today, the bedroom scene with Mr. McKee not only feels very queer to me, but makes Nick seem more moral, not less. Maggie Froelich writes, As a homosexual man, then, Nick understands the necessity of deceit in a society that defines one's desire and agency as illicit, and where there are eyes and cameras everywhere. In this, he identifies with women, particularly Jordan Baker. It would have been difficult for Nick to admit he was dishonest, but to come out as queer was actively dangerous. If Nick shares Fitzgerald's view of queerness, then his quest to defend his decency could also be his quest to defend his straightness. His determination to believe he's a good, honest person becomes his determination to believe he's straight. Why should I care? I've read a couple articles where people argue that Nick's queerness matters because it outs him as an unreliable narrator. There are other ways to tell that Nick's a liar, though. You can look at how Jordan Baker calls Nick out. You can look at the way Nick judges other people. You can look at the way Nick periodically stops the story to remind you he's a good person. You can look at the way he helps conceive and cover up his cousin's affair. You can compare the way he talks about Gatsby and Tom and claim that bias comes from Gatsby's hope or any of the other reasons I gave that weren't Nick's romantic love. Nick doesn't magically become an honest person because he's straight. To me, Nick's sexuality changes the shape of that dishonesty. It creates two versions of this book. Both are about deceit, and I think both are valid, but they contain very different Nicks. The queer version of The Great Gatsby paints a scenario where Nick's dishonesty comes not from a place of pride, but of self-preservation. That starkly changes Nick's relationship with people like Gatsby and Jordan. It changes why Nick feels the need to put the brakes on his desires when everyone around him can let loose and chase their pleasure. It adds a more tragic tinge to his struggle to be seen as moral and good. His desire to be separate becomes a desire to be without desire. He can't face he's fallen for Gatsby, so he clings to his status as a neutral observer. That version of the story will resonate with a lot of queer readers, and that's where I think Nick's sexuality will matter to some readers more than others. It won't break the novel to see Nick as straight. However, it does strike me as strange when people claim a queer version of this story doesn't exist at all when Mr. Fucking McKee is right fucking game. there! On the topic of people who claim a queer version of this story doesn't exist, I present to you The Great Gatsby, the straightest films ever made. Or, that's not fair, but yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty straight. There are five Great Gatsby films altogether, but the first one, a silent film, was famously lost. The 1949 film was boring as fuck. 130 men with 16 Lewis guns. 
That's when they made him a major. We got back to New York in November 1919. I picked up a railroad ticket for him to Louisville. I only managed to keep myself awake with a constant stream of raisinets. I wish I could tell you guys that this scene is gay, but somehow there are no undertones. The only thing that's wonderful is the face he makes when he gets shot. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> the 1974 Gatsby film has a Nick. He does the gay eye roll at Tom and Myrtle. Two girls dance, and that's kind of queer. That That's kind of all. Not for lack of trying, though. You see, Bob Evans asked Truman Capote to write up a screenplay for the 1974 film. Baz Luhrmann, that guy who's responsible for this, can tell you what happened next. There's a screenplay for 1974's The Great Gatsby written by Truman Capote, which I got my hands on. Bob Evans, whom I now know very well and who was running the studio at the time, rejected it because basically, Jordan is gay, and Nick is gay, and the script is too hardcore. Truman was really upset about it and went on television and called Paramount a bunch of wankers. It's in his hand, but it's totally legible. It's also unfinished. Basically, it's mad and bad and crazy. Seth was lovely enough to find and scan said mad, bad, and crazy screenplay from the New York Public Library, so now we can all read Capote's Gatsby. And while there's no Mr. McKee scene, Capote still makes his gay agenda known. I'm talking speculation about whether or not Gatsby's queer. I'm talking Nick and Gatsby skinny dipping together. This screenplay wasn't, uh, what's the word? Great. Well, if you were in my shoes, what would you have done? I don't know, Tom. I don't know. The camera trawls through the window and through the snow-flurried air towards a close-up of the huge, blue-eyed spectacles that cover the whole screen. Only t <laughs> I can't even say this line with a straight face. Only <laughs> Fuck. I can't. I'm gonna do it. Only Dr. J- <laughs> Only Dr. Only Dr. <laughs> Gonna do it. Only Dr. Eckelberg could ever answer that. Needless to say, Bob Evans called Francis Coppola, who worked with Jack Clayton to rebuild the screenplay from scratch. So, no queer Gatsby for us. Any and all hints of queerness were scrubbed away. The story was even padded out with more Gatsby and Daisy moments. So, that's a situation where someone tried to add queerness and was very much shut down. The 2000s film, more of the same. People often rank this Gatsby film as more queer than the others, and I, I kinda get that. In the book, after Gatsby gets turned down by Daisy, he still tells his butler to mind the phone. He wants to believe she'll still call him and tell him she's changed her mind. Daisy never calls, and Gatsby dies. But the 2000s film does this. Remember how I was like, oh, when you compare Nick's love for Gatsby versus Daisy's love for Gatsby, Nick's love was the most real. Gatsby expects a call from his lover, and Nick's the one, Nick's, Nick cares enough to check up on him. That's a direct comparison between Nick and Daisy, my dudes, with Nick as the person who comes out on top. That's kind of all. Then there's the 2013 film. I had hopes for this one, y'all. Mostly because of the year. I figured, yeah, 2013 was a very different landscape from 1949, 1974, and 2000. 2013's also very different from 2020. But I hoped we had come far enough along by that point that I could expect to see at least some level of and suddenly, I began to like you. Please stop making Nick aggressively straight for five fucking seconds! 
In the book, Catherine leans close and whispers in Nick's ear. That's the only clue we get to her and Nick's position. They only ever chat with each other, though you get the sense Catherine might want Nick to make a move on her. The Great Gatsby 2013 places Catherine on Nick's lap and has them make out. But they also pull the telephone switcheroo, which makes me happy. Baz Luhrmann, well, he's aware of the queer version of The Great Gatsby. He concedes that Capote might have been onto something with his queer portrayal of Nick. He's writing the book about Gatsby because he's trying to work out his feelings towards him, which, in any interpretation, are deeply romantic. Are they physically romantic? I don't think they ever were in the story. But is it possible that Nick Carraway could ever be physically romantic with a man? All that is going to be answered after the book is completed, when Nick Carraway is ready to be Nick Carraway, when he's able to find himself. Okay, so the phrase, able to find himself, sticks out to me here. It says to me that Baz's Nick doesn't know whether he's queer or not, and would need to take some time out to himself to come to that conclusion. My version of Nick knows deep down that he's queer, but wants to believe otherwise, so he puts on a mask and seeks others' reassurance. It's like Baz's Nick needs to find himself, and my Nick needs to face himself. Yeah, Baz doesn't seem opposed to a queer Nick, and we get a couple moments that could be queer, like the phone scene or maybe even this garden scene. And then there's the real gold mine. His smile was one of those rare smiles that you may come across four or five times in life. It seemed to understand you and believe in you just as you would like to be understood and believed in. But there's also... Take it. I said, I'm straight. While the film blatantly shows Nick's attraction to women, any attraction to men has to be mined from subtext. There's a divided consensus within the queer Gatsby circle as to whether this film went so far as to erase all hints of gayness. I know I wouldn't go that far, but I get the sense that the queer moments were designed to be covert enough to slip under the radar for anyone but queer fans. What, Rab? You want Nick and Gatsby to French kiss under the full moon? No. I want somebody to finally have the balls to adapt the scene with Mr. Fucking McKee. You can have straight versions, that's fine, but why do we not have any Mr. McKee? To me, Mr. McKee is the face of Nick's queerness. You can get queer vibes from Nick and talk about his bias towards Gatsby and maybe compare his love for Gatsby to Daisy's, but the scene with McKee provides the ground for that analysis to stand on. It's foundational to this version of The Great Gatsby, and none of the films include the bedroom scene with Mr. McKee. Nick never leaves the party with him, they never take the elevator together, they never end up in his room. Cause like, fine, the straight version, yeah, more people are gonna be aware of that one, make that. But why shy away from Mr. McKee altogether? Why erase him from these films? They all made that choice. Well, there's the extraneous scene argument, but at 47,000 words, half the length of The Hobbit, The Great Gatsby doesn't have a lot of room for extraneous scenes. The McKee scene doesn't appear to add a lot to the book at first glance, but neither does the scene where Myrtle and Tom buy a dog, and that got adapted. The fact that none of these films adapted the McKee scene says to me that time wasn't the most prominent factor here. See, there's a reason my classmates disregarded any suggestion that Nick was queer, but were perfectly happy to argue the symbolism of the color of Gatsby's car for half the period. Queer analysis doesn't carry the same validity as other essay topics. We're taught to only explore the straight and cis versions of any given story. It takes time to unlearn that lesson, and not everyone will do so. The McKee scene, along with any other queer vibes, has gone over a lot of Americans' heads for decades. There are people, teachers even, who will reread this book for years and years and still blip over McKee's bedroom. In the middle of a class discussion of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby some years ago, a student raised his hand and asked, in essence, what are we supposed to make of the scene where Nick Carraway goes off with a gay guy? And I said, in essence, wait, what gay guy? He pointed me to the scene that closes chapter three, 
This is the chapter in which Nick accompanies Tom Buchanan and his mistress, Myrtle, to an apartment Tom keeps in Manhattan. I had, I'm embarrassed to say, never seen that passage before. Except that's not true. I'd read the book half a dozen times since college and taught it once. But I had somehow missed the fact that the narrator wanders off in a drunken stupor with a stranger and ends up in his bedroom. When a person reads the McKee scene, Fitzgerald provides the words, but the reader's the one doing all the visual legwork. They can make the choice to hand wave the underwear and the bedroom as drunken nonsense. But a film would eliminate that control over the scene. A person would be forced to see Nick leave the party with another man, see him take the elevator down to his room, and see him next to that other man's bed with the other man stripped down to his underwear. It doesn't come up too often, but people do care about Gatsby as a story. Many people will have read this book at a very formative point in their lives, and most of them will have read Nick as straight. I dare posit a McKee bedroom scene would make a lot of those people upset or confused or both. And with big reboots like these, of course you want to avoid that reaction where you can. 2013 might have been a more tolerant year, but Warner Bros wanted to cast as wide a net as possible so as to make as much money as possible. Yeah, they're not gonna risk a bedroom scene with queer overtones, however short. Better to give Nick a good old case of the not gays. And maybe throw the queer fans a bone with some fireworks. I'm not gay no more. I am delivered. I don't like men no more. I said I like women. Women, 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 women. I said women. I'm not gay. You'd expect smaller adaptations to be more brazen, maybe. But The Great Gatsby is still under copyright in the United States. You can make an essay, sure, or a parody, something that's transformative enough to fall under fair use law. But to adapt The Great Gatsby as a US citizen, you would need permission from the Fitzgerald estate, which would take a fuck ton of time and likely a fuck ton of cash. These people are very protective of Gatsby as a property. One graphic novel has been given the green light from the estate, and there's no McKee bedroom scene. One stage play has been given exclusive rights, and there's no McKee bedroom scene. No, you aren't allowed to add one either. It's hard to get permission from the estate, and risky to move forward without that permission. It's no wonder we see so few glimpses of a queer Nick when the Great Gatsby, and by extension Nick's sexuality, are padlocked behind a copyright wall. Of the handful of people who have the gall or the cash to find a way over that wall, how many will care about or even notice the queer version of Gatsby? And how many will prioritize that queerness over their audience's comfort? But great news, guys! I have come here to promise you that gay exciting things are hovering in the next… a uh, couple months? Because The Great Gatsby is supposed to go into the public domain in 2021! So while there haven't been any overtly queer Gatsby adaptations yet, I'm pretty sure we'll get something now that monopolies won't be the only ones with the resources to access the story. You guys should let me know what you would do with The Great Gatsby. I would have Nick be in love with Gatsby, and Jordan could be non-binary and in love with Daisy, and Nick and Gatsby were in the war together, except Nick got gas gangrene and had to leave, and you know, his leg was amputated. Except then Nick wanders into one of Gatsby's parties, and he sees Gatsby and he's like, James! Except Gatsby turns around and he's like, sorry old sport, you must have me confused for someone else. My name's The Green Light is an eldritch abomination that feeds on greed, and we have to stop it before it takes over all of you. Staring down at her blood-covered hands, and Jordan won't stop shouting, Where's the baby, Daisy? Did he Where's kill those people? Baby? How much does he not remember? And how much does he not want to rest? Nick, like, would you? Would you really doom the New York Stock Exchange and plunge this country into an economic depression just so you can get your boyfriend's memories back? Would you, Nick? Would you? Whatever the case, I do hope we get a queer adaptation soon. Because while The Great Gatsby doesn't need to be queer to be good, a queer Gatsby would be very fun. Now I'm gonna go face myself. Hey ya squad! Thanks so much for watching this Mr. McKee fan video, and thank you so much to my Patreon supporters for all your help. Shout out to my top patrons, Luna Sarum, So Has to Litha, and Sally Graves. You guys are the real deal. 
It means so much to me that you would pledge. If you'd like to get your name on this list, see previews of my projects, and get videos early, you can mosey on over to my Patreon. I also want to get a little sentimental here for a second and throw a thank you out there to Miss Connor, my high school English teacher. I didn't know what literary analysis was before Miss Connor's class, and she used books like Gatsby to teach me and so many other kids like me how fun analysis can be. So much of my process still comes from her lessons, so thank you, English teacher who will never see this video. You truly are, as you would say, a goddess. Stay safe, everybody. See ya, sinners!